Hello everyone. Thanks for tuning into this episode of Zero Dhai Educate. In this episode, I caught up with Mr. Chirag Mehta, Senior Fund Manager at Quantum Asset Management. He's a qualified CAIA and has been at Quantum for over 15 years. And today we speak about gold. Chirag has a broad and deep understanding about managing this asset class at a very high professional level. And he shares some really valuable insights on how retail investors can understand, participate and manage their gold positions. We also get to know what macroeconomic factors affect gold and why it behaves differently than other assets. So let's begin. Chirag, so good to have you on our show. Welcome. Thank you, Sahil. Thank you for having me. We have a lot of questions regarding gold today, but let's start with the background. This journey of getting into finance, then becoming a fund manager, and your time at Quantum. How did it all go about? Tell us something about that. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, it's been a fascinating journey for me. Uh, I always had that logical and analytical bent uh, quest for numbers overall. So I think I, I was made for the field of finance overall. Uh, maybe I was not too qualified to become an engineer or do things which are really fruitful. So I kind of chose to be on the finance side and uh, uh, given my quest for numbers always helped me to progress further here. Uh, the what learnings I had uh, in my internship with uh, a company called Kotak and Company, uh, which uh, which is a company that kind of uh, deals in physical commodities, especially cotton. So I learned a good deal about managing, seeing the commodity trade and uh, learning hands on uh, in that. And also we worked for a company called or an entity called Federation of Indian Commodities. Uh, that company uh, uh, did projects to get the regional commodity exchanges on a common platform, although it didn't succeed. But I got an opportunity to work with stalwarts in that industry. Uh, uh, if you know Mr. Gnan Shekhar, uh, uh, Mr. Chandra Shekhar, Ms. Dina Mehta, Mr. Kotak, uh, all, all those guys were uh, involved in, in that uh, entity and trying to uplift the regional commodity exchanges. So I learned great stuff there. Uh, and, and that is how I got fascinated to the world of commodities. That, that's where I got the first exposure. And it kind of intrigued me a lot. And thereafter, uh, when I joined Quantum, I was assigned to uh, you know, analyze commodities overall for the organization and then uh, went on to launch one of the earliest gold funds in the country. Uh, so that experience, meeting different several participants in, in, in the gold market, learning the tricks of the trade uh, was, was really, really uh, useful and insightful for me. And uh, kind of we kind of Get, went there, learned it, became innovative, educated investors, why gold, why, how much gold, uh, those kind of traits, and then have them buy in rather than be selling our fund to them. So that is the approach that we had. Uh, and it's been a great journey migrating from commodities overall to look at alternative investments, uh, be it uh, uh, after the gold fund, be it the multi-asset fund, the equity fund of funds, and off late recently, the ESG fund, the kind of uh, field of sustainable finance is growing significantly. And that is a great area to be in. I think uh, uh, without sustainability, the financial field uh, won't grow much. So I think that is one area which I'm really happy uh, to be part of uh, the ESG fund. And I, I, I think that's going to become a significantly mainstream. Uh, the way gold has become mainstream in India, I think uh, sustainable-led uh, funds is going to be the mainstreaming of, uh, uh, of of the financial world. I'm a huge fan of commodity traders in my personal opinion. They are the purest forms of trader out there. They are, historically, this is where trading has the roots. This is where trading began, uh, trading commodities. Absolutely. Uh, I just wanted to know from you, how different is managing a commodity fund than, say, an equity or a uh, debt based fund so everything has its own intricacies and uh, details that to make it very very different right so in a commodity you're dealing with hard commodities right uh, and in there you have to be really careful because the quality divergences are significant you know uh, uh, it may appear same but it is two different things overall so that is one thing that you need to keep in mind uh, keep into account uh, for example, if you note uh, recently, even even in China, uh, uh, there were 83 tons of gold, which was, you know, 
which was not really gold. Right. You know, that was unheard. So, so you need to be very, very careful when it comes to because here investors are trusting you with their faith in saying that you will indeed buy real gold. Right. So that was one very important thing that we kind of uh, uh, became uh, 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 became known to the fact that we have to indeed be very careful, and that is where we designed the rules. Uh, so what kind of quality of gold we buy, from where we buy, all that became very, very different. And that was a real challenging part of it. You know, uh, There are so many types of gold, but narrowing down to what you really wanted to buy is, is the challenge of the commodity world. Plus, it moves in fractions of seconds, right? Uh, you, what... Uh, I, I mean, it's it's a completely OTC market, uh, like equity markets is revolutionized. You have electronic trading, uh, you see the betas, uh, whereas commodities are largely OTC trades, right? Especially physical commodities. Uh, so you have to be very, very careful in terms of where you buy and how fast you can buy, because it's all OTC, all non-transparent. Uh, you have to negotiate. So all those things are involved and all the intricacies go on the back end when we deal in that physical commodity. So it's been a real insightful, it's been real challenge, but uh, it's it's equal fun to do it. Mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, so it's relatively easier to understand what makes stock tick, as in the corporate action, there's demand supply, general uh, economic environment. But what does make gold tick? What does make gold go up and down? Yeah, there are many factors that you know uh, make gold uh, uh, move. Uh, people generally look at demand supply, but that's not the real driver of gold. Gold at the end of the day is money. It's been the longest persisting currency out there. It's been money for 5,000 or more years. Mm. And that is what, that is a trade that makes gold tick really. People kind of move and see uh, kind of the very narrow part of the market, which is demand supply. If you see from a supply perspective, all the gold that has been mined till date is still existing. It's still out there. So uh, if you are virtually seeing that there is 200,000 tons of gold out there and you are just measuring 2,000, 3,000 tons of gold to see whether it will make gold tick or not, you know, that's not really that what takes, makes gold move. It's the money trade of gold being money is what moves gold markets. And given that uh, uh, it, is, it is a monetary asset, well, the two big drivers of gold are uh, real interest rates, which is interest rates minus inflation, because that is the real cost of money, right? And if gold is money, the cost of money should be a competing factor to it. Right. So real interest rates are one of the important factors that gold move. And second is the money supply. Uh, how much the central banks of the world are printing dollars, printing euros, printing currencies, that is what moves gold. Because that is the monetary inflation out there. And uh, gold, given it's constrained in terms of supply, you cannot significantly increase supply of gold every year. Uh, uh, whatever, uh, how much more dollars are printed, that is what moves gold. So these are two main important things that may make gold move. And thirdly, for an Indian investor, it will be how much, how the rupee is doing. How, if you've seen over years, rupee has depreciated by two, three, four percent annually, and that is one other factor apart from the dollar gold price that makes the Indian gold price move. And and lastly, uh, the cherry on the top is the regulations, right? Mm -hmm. So you have seen customs duty move up and down today. The customs duty is about uh, the taxes and duties combined are about ten percent in total. So that that uh, over a period of time has been differing because government changes them. And that is one factor also that moves gold prices. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, if you have to analyze gold, think of it as money. Gold as money. This is something I'll write down. So uh, in your answer, it seemed that gold is generally majorly about the macros. And uh, we did have a lot of macro activity in 2020, a year we'll never forget. The central banks were very active. The markets were crashing, then rebounding spectacularly. There was a lot of paranoia, uh, some scare. So from your vantage point, the big picture view, that 10,000 feet view, how did it all look? 
So it was really challenging, right? It was something that uh, maybe we, if we had to see something similar happen, we had to go 100 years back when none of us were living, right? Mm -hmm. So it was really challenging, really filled with uncertainty in terms of how things will pan out, uh, how things will shape up, whether this will end soon or it will be a long lasting thing for us. So that was an unknown uh, uh, amongst us. And if you look at gold, that did as per its expectations, right? In a year when other assets were collapsing, gold was one standing tall. And this has happened time and again. Uh, if you look at the 2008 crisis or any other crisis, uh, gold has stood tall. And this time also, it did the same. So gold overall uh, is a great diversifier. It's a great store of value. And that is the thing that it did in a year of uncertainty. So uh, it has always stood uh, the, the test of times. And it has always helped when other things were not working for you. So overall, uh, in that uncertain year last year that we had, so all those who were relying on an asset allocation and having an allocation to gold, which we've always recommended or always prescribed, uh, those investors were kind of, you know, uh, uh, telling us that, yes, your, your recommendations helped us. Uh, and the impact on our portfolio was very, very minimal, even in the depths of crisis. So overall, that teaches you a lesson in terms of uh, to have an asset allocation in play, have different assets in play. And gold is, again, a very useful asset during such times. So to have gold is, is really essential. And uh, uh, as always, after a crisis, uh, the, uh, um, the gold values, gold's value becomes amplified overall. Mm -hmm. So uh, even last year, we saw a lot of investors come in and generate that gold rush we usually see after the crisis mm -hmm. so a lot of investors uh, realizing the importance of gold in the portfolio started buying a lot of gold uh, there was shortage of gold uh, last year because uh, the trade channels were kind of uh, blocked yeah. for a certain amount of time to source gold to get gold uh, and ensure that each and every unit is backed by gold uh, was the task that we had at that point in time and i think we delivered well uh, mm -hmm. investors bought and were able to buy uh, investors who kind of had a crisis and had to sell gold were easily able to sell gold ETFs or gold funds uh, holding of the arts. But if they were holding physical gold, they were not able to do so. So again, this amplified uh, the value of gold and also what forms of gold you should be buying into. Apart from uncertainty and crisis, Indians generally do not need a reason to rush to gold for some reason. We are a gold-loving nation, Absolutely. largest consumer uh, at the retail level, consum consumer of gold. So uh, we don't have much of it under our soil. We, we don't mine it that much. We don't have the natural reserves. Mm -hmm. But what makes us such a gold-loving nation, historically and in the present scenario? Historically, there were two main reasons for the gold affinity that we have, right? One was safety and another was liquidity. If you look at rural areas, right, uh, what options did they have in terms of savings? Mm. They didn't have any. Financial inclusion was so low that people were reliant on gold because it was safe. They can wear it on their body and mm. that makes it safe. And another was liquidity, which means uh, if they want money, even at midnight, they could knock uh, the door of the money lender and get money against the gold that they have. So those safety and liquidity aspects have always helped uh, in terms of uh, making gold the popular instrument that it has. Uh, secondly, uh, if you look at uh, gold as an instrument, it has always uh, so far helped the households on whose balance sheets that was. Uh, because if you see returns from gold has been significantly better or at par with any other instrument out there. Right. Of right. course, equities over the long run have generated higher returns, but at the mm. same time, they have been equally volatile. Right. right. So, so this uh, is a follow up question to this extension. Mm. How has gold performed broadly in the markets compared to bonds and uh, equities? So if you look at uh, long term returns, say like 15, 20 years returns from gold and equities, uh, gold returns have been a tad lower. But at the same time, if you were look to look at the volatility or the drawdowns in gold and equities, uh, the drawdowns in gold have been half of what we have seen in equity markets. Mm -hmm. uh, the volatility is a tad lower, maybe four or five percentage points lower than what we see in equities. And therefore, a slightly lower return is warranted to the risk that you are taking. So overall, uh, I don't think gold has fared poorly as compared to the competing asset classes. It has done better than bonds, 
and slightly lower than equities. So overall, uh, there is a good performance and all those households who have a large portion of their money lying in form of, you know, uh, gold holdings, it hasn't disappointed them so much. It has mm -hmm. given them good, decent returns uh, and comparable uh, to the risk adjusted of any other asset class out there. Right. As you said, in rural context, a lot of times people were buying gold because they could wear it on them. But in 2021, we have uh, n number of ways to take a position in gold. Uh, so what would you th say is the best way for the average investor to take a position in gold? Is it uh, bullion? Is it sovereign gold fund, ETFs, mutual funds? How? Sure. Uh, initially, if you look at uh, maybe 15, 20 years before, right? Uh, holding gold in other forms was prohibited. Even in forms of coins and bars, it was allowed to a certain extent, not beyond a, a, a large extent. So uh, jewelry was a predominant form allowed for uh, buying gold and holding gold. Uh, things have changed now, right? But still that there is inertia, there is, there is that you know, habit form mm. that whenever you buy gold, even though it is for an investment purpose, it, it people tend to buy jewelry you know there is very thin thin line between uh, what people buy for right be it uh, be it for consumption or be it for investment but it's time now that investors differentiate why they are buying gold for consumption for wearing you don't have a choice you have to buy jewelry but for investments there are so many efficient forms that have come which are we are significantly better which give you that gain for your for the buck that you have hmm. uh for example gold etf gold etf i think it's the best financial innovation out there and why do i say so because it allows a retail investor buying say uh half a gram one gram or even lower quantities at a price at which tons and tons of gold get exchanged between a bullion bank and a gold producer when a bullion bank buys from a gold producer they're buying 100 tons or significantly higher quantities from the gold producer directly and then channelizing into various media so uh, the gold etf allows them to buy at that prices you know that is the efficiency that it brings from the wholesale level to the retail level and that is why i call it the best financial innovation apart from the price efficiency that it offers people don't have to worry about the purity they can buy sitting at home and even in the lockdowns that we saw last year which i hope we don't see it any 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 going in the future yes, but uh, but still uh, in that uh, it's times also people were able to easily buy and sell with liquidity uh, of of the amount that they wanted uh, whereas in physical gold when you are holding physical gold there were people who had emergency and wanted to sell gold but were not able to do so because shops were shut right so that really tells you that this is the time, this crisis has given that opportunity to transform behavior uh, and very tough decisions or very significant change in habits only come when there is a crisis, right? And mm -hmm. this crisis has given, uh, shown many people that way. And we are incrementally seeing a lot of people going towards these efficient forms of buying gold, like gold ETS, gold mutual funds, or big sovereign gold bonds. Mm -hmm. So anytime, I think if you are looking to buy gold, first say, for what reason you're buying to? Uh, is it consumption or is it investment? And when it comes to investment, it has to be only these new age uh, efficient forms that have come, which is either gold ETFs, gold mutual funds, or the sovereign gold bond. Hmm. Makes sense. So as per the expectations uh, which will be set by the investor, as an average investor, what expectations should I have and not have with my gold holdings? Is it as a safety hedge? Is it something to generate wealth? Or is it just to conserve my wealth? Yeah, so the biggest role that gold plays is being a portfolio diversifier. We tell people that invest in gold today and pray hard that it falls in value by 50% tomorrow. The very next day, it should fall by 50% after you have invested. Why? We always advocate that you should have about 10 to 15% allocation to gold in your portfolio. If that 15% allocation that you have falls by half, which means that your 85% of your value or your portfolio will be doing much better. Mm -hmm. 
And therefore, uh, whenever that 85% is not doing well, you better have this 15%. Hmm. So that is how we tell people to look at gold, really. And uh, the biggest role that it plays is diversify because your when your 85% is not doing well, this 15% will help you. And whenever there is, a, say, inflationary prospect, like India has had high inflation yeah. for long periods, right? Even uh, when when uh, things were better, we still had three, four, five percent inflation. And at if you look at the long term average, it has been seven, eight percent kind of inflation. Even in the future, we expect five, six percent inflation to persist, given the growing economy that we have. Uh, and uh, gold is a great store of value. Mm -hmm. uh, many times we have seen your fixed income instruments, your FDs, for example, uh, tend to give you negative returns on a real basis mm -hmm. because your FD today gives you around 5% returns. Today, inflation is more than 6%. Mm -hmm. So even today, with your fixed deposits, you are earning negative on a real basis. That doesn't do good to improve your standard of living. The money that you're saving hard is to ensure that your standard of living improves over a period of time. Uh, with equities, it is possible. Gold or long periods, it at least matches your standard of living. With fixed deposits, kind of, you kind of many times on that negative real return. So that is the role that gold plays, being a portfolio diversifier and being a great store of value. Right. Uh, so one of the extensions to your answer would be, uh, investors generally have a very hard time as to how much to allocate to gold. Many people are given this uh, one size fits all a number, be it 5% or be it 25%. So how should an investor allocate it to the gold holdings? So I think one size fits all uh, is the answer for that. Uh, I think it's a very narrow band and that is tested with numbers. So we kind of recommend that uh, investors have 10 to 15% allocation to gold. And uh, uh, the reason for that is, at 10 to 15 percent allocation uh, of one's portfolio it doesn't compromise the overall returns of a portfolio mm. it kind of augments that improves that a little and at the same time the risk that you end up taking uh, of the overall portfolio reduces significantly when you have 10 to 15 percent allocation to gold so overall uh, you're not compromising on returns whereas the risk of your overall portfolio reduces substantially with that 10 to 15 percent allocation to gold and therefore, uh, that is backed by hard numbers. The risk-adjusted returns continue to improve with addition of gold. But uh, beyond that 15% mark, it kind of diminishes the overall, starts diminishing the overall return. And therefore, 10 to 15% is tested by hard numbers. And I think that is the uh, number that we recommend to people. Have 10 to 15% allocation to gold. And, and that should help you diversify adequately without impacting overall long-term returns of your portfolio. Yeah. So now there are some arguments against gold, which I want your take on. One would be gold by itself is a volatile uh, asset. So if you pair it with equities, another volatile asset, how does this pairing play out? How, what, how does it make sense to put two volatile assets in your portfolio? Yeah. Uh, so just to clarify that gold's volatility is a tad lower than equities. Of course, equities have a higher return to compensate for that volatility. Uh, if you look at uh, the time periods in which uh, what, what factors that move gold or what factors that move equities are very, very different set of factors. And therefore, we have seen that uh, there is a negative correlation between equities and gold. Whenever equities are doing well, gold generally doesn't do well unless there is an inflationary prospect that kind of uh, lifts both the asset classes. We have seen periods of that as well. But most periods when equities do not do well, have given you negative returns, those years, uh, gold tends to do well. And therefore, uh, though be both being uh, significantly volatile asset classes, uh, it tends to help you because both move uh, higher in different time frames. Mm. And therefore, uh, it, it's like a second engine of your, of, your, of your aircraft or your boat. When one engine is not working, the second engine kind of lifts you or takes you higher. So that is what role that gold plays. When your equities are not doing well, when they are volatile, when they are crashing, there is a gold which probably will do well and will help you. Uh, so, so for example, if you take an year like 2008, right? Uh, 2008 equities fell by 
if you had a goal, for example, your child's education, right? Mm -hmm. Maturing and payment due in that year. Would you sell equities at half percent, a uh, fifty percent loss, or would you mind uh, embarking on gold, which is up thirty percent in that year, right? So it helps you. That diversification really helps you to fulfill your immediate uh, goal, financial goal that you're looking for, and that is where the usefulness of gold. Times when equities are not doing well, gold will hopefully doing well. That is yes. what we have seen historically, at least. That's a nice analogy you gave. The second engine to your portfolio. Yeah. There's this other argument which keeps coming up that gold has long drawdowns. The periods in which it does nothing just sits. So a better way to invest gold is to enter and exit, to time your entries and exit, rather than just holding it for long term. What's your take and opinion on this? So I think an allocation of to gold of one's portfolio has really worked well. Uh, you don't know when the uncertainties kind of come. Never, no one predicted 2000, uh, mm. 20, 2020, right? No one predicted uh, 2008. 2008 was to some extent predictable, but no one predicted 2001 9-11 uh, attacks, right? Uh, so there are certain unknowns which are kind of unpredictable. You don't know when they're coming, uh, uh, coming in front of us and impacting our portfolios. Uh, to have an allocation is most desired. Whereas you can trim that allocation up and down depending on the cycle that you are. And that is what we typically call as rebalancing, right? Mm. Uh, whenever gold has done well, uh, your other asset classes may not have done so well. And therefore, it calls for rebalancing and allocating, taking profits from gold and investing into asset class that has not done well, which is equities. Uh, and, and similarly goes uh, the other way. So in some way, you're tactically uh, moving from an asset that has done well to an asset that is not doing well, so that in the next cycle, uh, you kind of make more profits there. Uh, so uh, so I, I will recommend that at least a, some portion of your portfolio to be there at all times, and some which can be done through rebalancings, uh, that can be done tactically. So, uh, so to give you an answer, a short answer to your question, is have a certain allocation, say a 10% allocation at all times, and that 5% can be that rebalancing trades that you could do. Sure. Makes sense. So uh, there's this guessing game going on as to what central banks would do. Would taper come? Would it not come? So it has become uh, you know, a breakfast, a lunch, and dinner conversation of every investor. Yes. So how do you think it's going to impact gold going forwards in this decade? So I think what central bankers across the world do has a big bearing on uh, on gold because essentially what they are doing is uh, one is uh, uh, interest rates. They're, they are kind of controlling that. And second is they are kind of keeping a tab on money supply. Right, Both factors, as we have discussed before, tend to move gold in a very big way. Mm -hmm. So uh, so looking at the uh, scenario today, right? so far we have had that V-shape recovery. So it will all boil down to whether the growth momentum continues or not, right? And whether the inflation that we have today is going to be transitory, like what central banks tell us, or not. So those are the two factors that will determine how gold will behave going forward. Uh, and so far, we have seen that V-shape recovery. Many expect that that V-shape recovery is going to continue in the same manner like we have seen over the last few months. Uh, but our guess is that any recovery from here on will be gradual. Hmm. It's not going to be that V-shape that we saw. Uh, given the amounts of money that have been pumped in by central banks, trillions of dollars with interest rates uh, kept at the zero bound, uh, would lead to certain recovery. And I think that recovery is behind us. Uh, going forward, we will see recovery, but it's going to be a lot more tepid. It's more, a lot more gradual than what we have seen. And therefore... Uh, central bankers will need to be accommodative, right? Today, we are slightly tad better than what we were in the depths of 2008 crisis from an employment perspective, mm -hmm. from an economic recovery perspective, right? After the 2008 crisis, central banks had to keep rates low for six years, mm -hmm. right? And this time, I don't think that economy is good enough that it will not need that support. So... We, uh, what we think is uh, central banks will have to keep rates low for an extended period. They will have to keep that support in terms of money printing uh, to keep that momentum going. And uh, both these factors will help gold because uh, we think that in inflation with growth that we have seen 
uh, is is kind of a little sticky with kind of the wage inflation is about to set in. Hmm. Uh, uh, if you look at the minimum wage increases in the U.S. that have been promised at fifteen dollars, we're significantly higher than the rate wages that stay today. Uh, and therefore, whenever we have seen episodes of wage inflation, it tends to be a lot more sticky. It tends to be a lot more structural as opposed to transitory that central banks call it today. So uh, on a real interest rate basis, we think real interest rates will be uh, lower, uh, will stay lower for an extended period. Because uh, if you see both both the sides of the equation, that is interest rates are likely to stay low. Inflation is likely to stay higher and sticky. And therefore, real interest rates on an, uh, which is interest rates minus inflation, is going to be, uh, will remain low. Uh, second is they will need to be more accommodative and uh, stay accommodative for some time. They may reduce the amount of accommodation, but they will still continue printing. And uh, from that perspective, there will be increase in money supply. That is another driving factor for coal. Mm. So both these managed by central banks overall uh, is, is going to be in gold's favor. So we think that uh, uh, the best of the days are not behind us. Mm. I think uh, gold will see uh, uh, move higher. But I think uh, the kind of pace that we have seen uh, over the last one, two years, it's not going to be that paced, fast paced. It's going to be gradual because at the same time, there is competition from other asset classes like equities and uh, which will kind of uh, lead to the bulk of flows. Uh, and therefore, that's going to be a challenge to gold unless we see more uncertainties like third wave or uh, COVID stays with FUDs for longer. Uh, Gold is going to be a gradually moving asset and, and it's going to be moving upside, I think. Hmm. Now, coming from gold in the world, now coming to gold in the mutual fund, how is gold, just out of curiosity, how is gold managed? Where is it stored? What is the quality of gold that is stored? Sure, that's a very good question. And I think that will lend to more buyers of the gold mutual funds hmm. out there when they get that comfort and the trust in how we manage it. So, overall, uh, uh, the way uh, the gold that we buy is only the London bullion market accredited investors uh, gold that we buy. Uh, LBMA is London Bullion Market Association, which is an authority in precious metals, is a global authority in precious metals. rather. Uh, so they have framed certain rules for refiners to follow, and they are very, very stringent out there. So only those refiners gold is what we buy. And it is 24 karat gold. It is... Uh, it is 995999 priority, which is akin to 24 karat gold that we all know about. Hmm. Uh, and uh, we have certain stringent rules in terms of once the gold we buy, uh, the gold that we buy shouldn't have left the custody of the approved vaulters. So anything that, say, you have purchased and taken home is not that we will accept that gold back in the fund. Uh, so each and every gold unit is, uh, each and every unit is backed by physical gold. And that gold has to be the highest quality that one can one can get, right? It's LBMA approved refiners, 995 purity minimum, uh, which is 24 karat. And all this gold is stored in very secured and professional vaults. If you have known entities like Brinks, hmm. uh, for example, they have the uh, uh, ATMs that fill uh, cash. Uh, it's done by these, these guys. And also they have very professional vaults with all the security measures out there, uh, be it armed guards, be it panic alarms, be it the vaults, uh, walls with iron clad fillings. Uh, so it's difficult to break into. Uh, it has those moving alarm and any, anything that moves, it will ring an alarm and they are all connected to police stations and stuff. So it's all, all very, very secure out there. And all the gold that is owned by the fund is hundred percent insured and includes even terrorism insurance. Mm. So we don't kind of compromise on the insurance cover. It's very, very comprehensive cover that we take. Uh, so overall, from an investor perspective, it's all very, very safe, pure, and insured. So uh, so I think uh, that would give more comfort to investors who are wanting to buy gold in a big way and trusting the gold funds, gold ETFs, and gold mutual funds out there. Hmm. I've been very fascinated with this, uh, watching it in the movies. So uh, how should you pick a mutual fund, which is gold based? What factors should we consider as an average investor? So from a performance perspective, uh, one 
yardstick of measuring any gold ETF or a gold fund is a tracking error. Uh, tracking error is nothing but the deviation the gold fund manager has in terms of uh, returns or risk or any characteristics as different from the gold price, right? The, the amount it deviates more, uh, you shouldn't buy that kind of fund. Lesser the deviation, it is a better fund for you. That's one important performance metric that you need to track. Second, uh, what kind of policies and processes that the fund manager has to ensure the safety of your gold, right? So for example, I, I, I am not able to tell about other fund houses trades, hmm. but I can very well tell at least about what we do at Quantum. Uh, we uh, have very strict standards in terms of the gold that we buy, as, as I said, LBMA accredited refiners, all physical gold, no derivatives, um, all gold is to be checked by and audited by the auditors and we ourselves, including me, go to the uh, vaults every month to check the gold that we have. So we don't rely only on third party verifications, we ourselves go to the vault and check the gold that we have. Uh, second is we also do uh, what is called as a purity test of the gold. Uh, once in a year, we will uh, hire a third party verification agency that will come with their machines to the vault and check the purity of the gold. Although we are very sure of the standards that we follow the type of gold that we buy, but we also kind of go uh, uh, hire these agencies to check the purity of the gold. So we have been doing this for years together. Uh, and, and that gives us more assurance on the type of gold that we have, we have for investors. And, and uh, that, that gives us a lot more comfort in the fiduciary duty that we have towards investors. Uh, so overall, uh, and, and, and lastly and importantly, uh, we educate investors in terms of what things they should monitor when they buy and sell gold. So we write a gold column, uh, we write a monthly view uh, to educate investors and tell them uh, the traits of gold, what kind of factors are moving gold, and what they should keep into account when they're buying or selling gold. So uh, so those are the things that we follow to give that add-on or value add to the investors mm. uh, in terms of knowing that the gold is not only safe, pure, and uh, insured, but also what things that they need to keep into account. Uh, Chirag, what's your personal investment philosophy? How do you trade you know, apart from gold? Any insights so I, on that? Yeah, so I do have, uh, uh, I keep it as an allocation to gold, though I kind of follow gold very closely. I kind of, uh, I, I kind of don't trade into gold. I think it is an integral part of the portfolio. And I, whenever there is an imbalance in the portfolio allocation, I kind of add it up uh, over a period of time. And that addition, I kind of try and see, uh, I don't do a systematic investment, but I kind of knowing the gold market better, I kind of see when is a good time to buy gold and add it mm -hmm. at, at those times. Like example, uh, uh, in March, 2020, uh, there wasn't, uh, uh, there wasn't much movement in gold that we had seen, although the factors had become really very conducive. So that, that was, uh, uh really telling you, uh, uh like, a uh, th something telling you very, very earlier, uh, that was something that was telling you really that given the factors, gold hadn't moved much and it should have moved higher. Mm -hmm. So those are the times uh, either investors who do not follow gold closely, uh, kind of added uh, at regular intervals by doing a systematic investments. All those who follow gold uh, very closely, those are the times that you could take advantage of and add gold. Uh, but personally, I think it's an integral part of the portfolio and I keep it as an allocation to gold at all times and add it whenever I think it's a good time or uh, my allocation has gone down to the level from the level that I mm -hmm. really need for. Every fund manager, even every trader has some story which you know keeps them up at night at a time where the underlying didn't move in a way it should have moved or it moved in a way that was completely contrary to what the fund manager was thinking. Any such story where your uh, you know area of expertise uh, gave you a bouncer of sorts? Yeah, uh, if you look at uh, the current times, right? Uh, markets have been running really uh, uh, expensive from a valuation standpoint for last one year, right? Uh, so we do manage a multi-asset fund 
uh, uh, where wherein you know uh, because of COVID gave us a great opportunity to allocate uh, higher amounts to equities, hmm. which we did at that time. So we had a very low allocation before COVID at twenty five percent. Uh, in that one month alone, when market crashed by forty percent, we lifted our allocation from twenty five percent to fifty percent. And then, or as markets rallied significantly and became more expensive, we kind of reduced our allocation uh, gradually, hmm. uh, and have been sitting at very low allocation at twenty five percent equity. But markets keep inching higher. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that's been uh, uh, one thing that's uh, a little puzzling. But I think we did the right thing in terms of you know uh, keeping risk lower in terms of maintaining a lower equity allocation. So that investors uh, uh, do not, if there is a market collapse, there will be very low impact in terms of uh, uh, overall on the equity on the portfolio that we have in mm -hmm. the multi asset fund. Okay. So, so that is where we see it. Uh, that's one thing that's been puzzling, but mm -hmm. uh, it's been testing our patience. But we are kind of very prudent, very disciplined, and maintaining our low allocation to equities. Chirag, one more question from you. We had a lot of takeaways from you today. But mm -hmm. one final takeaway, if there was this one movie or book or podcast or anything you want to recommend that every investor should at least, you know, read through it, go through it, which uh, recommendation would it be? So uh, if you are looking at uh, macro overall, and that is what something that moves uh, gold, mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, the, the there is a lady called Lynn Alden. You can uh, see she writes fabulous stuff in terms of comparing uh, history over many, many years, maybe 100 years ago, and what happened then and what's happening now. Uh, because, you know, there is a lot of comparability. The principles don't change often, right? Mm. And therefore, there is some cues to take from historic lessons that we have. So maybe that, or you could refer to Mises Institute, which gives great lessons in Austrian economics, that is what. Mm. And thirdly, if you look at uh, uh, a company called Incrementum, uh, they have a very detailed report in gold called In Gold We Trust. Uh, that is something has fascinating charts, fascinating uh, historical analysis, uh, fascinating things about factors that move gold. So these are the top three things I think that investors, if you want to learn more about gold, these are the things that you could refer to and i think it will be a great value add for you fantastic thank you so much Rag. this entire conversation was filled was filled with gold nuggets to, if i can say that so uh of course with this podcast episode we have learned a lot about gold and for many investors their perception of gold might have changed because of it and they will also delve deeper in their own research in their own study which is very important for the investors regardless so uh thank you so much Rag. Thank you, Sahil. It was a great conversation and I hope investors make the right choices, at least when it comes to investing or buying gold. Absolutely. So this is what we have for you today in this episode of Zero Dha Educate. We'll meet you with another guest uh, on another great topic. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risk. Read all scheme related documents carefully. This show is intended solely for learning and sharing information. Please do not construe anything said in this show as investment advisory or solicitation to invest. All the statements made herein are the personal and individual views of the host and should not be construed as opinion of Zerodha. Please consult your financial advisors before taking any investment decisions. <laughs>